This video is sponsored by Dice Dungeons. Stick around after the show for a special offer. Has this ever happened to you? You're just minding your own 11-year-old business when BAM! A group of strange old homeless men tell you that you've just been hired to solve every geopolitical problem in the world, and then one thing leads to another, and before you've even completed your intern training, you're stuck in an iceberg for a century? No? Well, would you like it to? Good! Then you're in luck! Because in 5th edition, there's rules for that. Today, we're going to figure out how to make you into an avatar, as in of Avatar The Last Airbender fame. If you're looking to play a blue space cat instead, you... I mean, you aren't though. You just aren't. Nobody actually confuses these two franchises anymore, but I'm supposed to make a joke about it like you do, right? Well, there you go. There it is. There's your joke. I hope you're happy, James Cameron. You see what you've done to this world? Do you see what you've done? Anyway, let's outline our goal. We want stunningly well choreographed and executed martial arts. We want control over the four Empedoclean elements of water, earth, fire, and air. And we want wisdom beyond our, or anyone else's, years through access to knowledge gleaned through a nigh infinite cycle of reincarnated lives. And we want it all before Sozin's Comet destroys daily life as we know it this summer. We may have been a little bit late on that one. So. Sounds like kind of a tall order, and it should, right? It took Aang three incredible seasons and Korra four seasons to really get the hang of their powers and duties. But tell you what, we're gonna try and get you at least the basics by level six. And as usual, we're gonna do it through features, basically entirely through uh, class features this time, hmm, which is a little weird, but that's cool. To start off, here's a little philosophy puzzle for you. Before you become the most important person in the world, who are you? That's right, you are less important than the most important person in the world. And to simulate that, let's give you a properly obscure origin as a rogue. Kiyoshi worked her way up from one, and so will you. Focusing decks first will let us be good both now as rogues and in the future as rampaging karate children. After that, it only seems right that our rough life on the streets, plus our desire to know all that can be known from eldritch sources of the beyond, gives us a pretty high wisdom. Go nuts with whatever you like past that, but if you're planning on following in the footsteps of Yang Chen and negotiating a bunch of peacekeeping treaties, maybe... Consider charisma? If you want to be like Korik instead, just just don't. Don't do not do that. Anyway, as a rogue, we get all the normal benefits, like cunning action and sneak attack. But the main attraction we're here for is an unearthed arcana subclass we pick up at level 3, the Phantom Rogue, formerly known as the Revived Rogue. The flavor of this subclass is supposed to be that as a rogue does all their roguely killing, they start to develop some pretty friendly relationships with those on the other side. But who's to say that those dead people can't be past use. Every long or short rest, you get to reorient a floating proficiency in a skill or tool of your choice, all based on the advice and habits of your past selves. A couple of times a day, you can also use this nifty Whales of the Dead feature, which lets you deal half your sneak attack dice as psychic damage to a creature within 30 feet of one you've just snuck a tuck. Perfect for those moments when you want to physically manifest a past self to give a well-deserved scolding. Now, using the wisdom of my past lives, I predict that you are thinking, okay, yeah, out of combat utility is all well and cool, my guy, but when are you gonna talk about the bending? When are you gonna talk about the bending? It's not called the last air sneaker. Which I think may be a basketball shoe? But no, you're right. Let's get to the bending. Easy, straightforward. Take three levels in Monk. Boom. Already, we got martial arts out the secret tunnel. When you get a chance to pick a subclass, choose to embark on the Way of Four Elements. Right off the bat, this unlocks Elemental Attunement, which lets us channel any of the four elements in basic party trick ways anytime we like. And that's going to do a lot for our status as a bender. Beyond that, though, you get access to different Elemental Disciplines, which are essentially elemental spells like Burning Hands, Thunder Wave, Create Water, and Gust of Wind that expend key points to be cast. There are also unique options special built for the monk, like Water Whip, Fist of Unbroken Air, and Fangs of the fire snake, which, I'm not gonna lie, sound more than a little tailored for this exact concept. You get one of these disciplines right along with elemental attunement, and you pick up one more at level 6, 11, and 17, which comes to a total of... Hey, four! That's perfect! You also get to upgrade both the effective spell level of your disciplines and switch out your early choices as you progress. We're obviously gonna have a little bit of trouble maintaining enough key to power all this cool stuff, so I'd suggest keeping in with Monk for the rest of the campaign to start building that pool. You may find that your DM is a little hesitant to let you play the actual avatar in a campaign about, say, the actual avatar. Teamwork really is the name of the game after all. But honestly, this concept still works perfectly as part of a bigger world. Every team needs their mystic, and knowing D&D adventurers, you probably won't be the only one to be claiming that you're the most important character in the world. But if you can happen to swing a party of three other elementally inclined casters and a fighter with a penchant for a uh, exotic boomerang proficiency, go for it. But hey, why should 5th edition get to have all the fun? Tune back in next time as we take a decidedly kinetic look at how to achieve a similar effect in Pathfinder. Expect a little, well, a lot more math and charts, but until then, I believe that you can save the world. Ta -da.
We'd like to give a quick shout out to our sponsor, DiceDungeons.com. You can use our code DOORMONSTER on their website to get 10% off your order. They've got a bunch of great stuff there. They have marble dice, they have metal dice, they have little tokens for your characters, like little coins that fit on battle maps. They have cloth battle maps. They also have these gorgeous rosewood boxes, and uh, I think it's all great. You should go look around and use our code DOORMONSTER to get 10% off. DiceDungeons.com. Do it! Hey everyone, this is the part of the video where I go back and look at your comments and address them from the last video, which was the grappling video, which was a pretty big undertaking, but y'all seem to like it, so that's great to hear. A few things that y'all uh, commented a lot about. First off, for all of you who said there wasn't a link to the grappling grid in the description, there was a little bit of a mix-up and it took a while to get up there, but it's there now, so if you wanted it and you didn't get a link to it when you watched the first time, go back and check, it's there. Uh, second, I would like to specifically point out Dicerson, who elaborated on some of the issues with Cassidy casting spells while grappled. First off, you have to have the material components in hand if it requires material components or you don't have SU materials. And second, you can't cast it if it has any somatic components, like you gotta wiggle your arms around because hey, you're grappled. Other than that, apparently I got most of it right, so that's cool. Glad to hear that. And third, a lot of y'all wanted to see about builds uh, that are good at grappling, and I thought about doing that, but it was already going long, and I'd have to explain a whole bunch more. But uh, for some places to get started looking, the most basic grappling build is with the Tatori archetype for the monk, who just gets a bunch of the grappling feats for free and uh, lets you pick some uh, additional feats to sort of improve your grappling experience. Another way to do it is to go with Brawler. A lot of Brawler class features help you get past some of those prerequisites. There's a Strangler archetype, which is good for strangling. I think there's some things with shifter that lets you use natural attacks to use uh, like the grab action. Or if you have animal companions, some of them have the grab action, which is a whole nother set of stuff. I'm gonna do a natural attacks video at some point because natural attacks are a whole big ball of fun and difficulty. Uh, some of those even have the uh, special ability to grab from a distance. And uh, anytime you succeed a grapple check from a distance, like you've got a frog with a big sticky tongue or whatever, there's an additional bit where you get just, just like drag them in close as part of the grapple check. They just become adjacent to you if they can. I think that was mostly it. If you, after hearing all this, decide, no wait, he got more wrong, still tell me. And other than that, go ahead and leave other things you want to hear about, either 5th edition or Pathfinder, or hey, even other systems in the comments on this video. And I'll, I'm always looking for ideas, but next week we've got the Pathfinder Kineticist coming up, so look out for that.